station with someone, run errands, hold someone's hand. All you need is a willingness to help others. Our volunteers believe the blessings they receive far exceed the services they offer. Will you consider serving, caring, and making a difference? Call today, 873-7441. Hospice of Marion County, making more moments of life possible. All right, five minutes after nine o'clock. Thank you for tuning in Wednesday. Things are going to cool down a little bit toward the end of the week, right? Just, I, I, I guess not compared to the rest of the country, but for us, 46 is cold for us, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> we have, uh, you, you probably have heard us announcing that there's uh, a, a bone marrow registry this drive, this this Saturday over at Mojo's mm-hmm. here, uh, not too far from here, there's three Mojo's. Yep. This is the one here on 17th. Right? Yeah, you know, 17th Street and Highway 200. And, uh, and and every day you hear us talking to Galen Unold from Life South Community Blood Center. There are so many different reasons why we are becoming better at understanding, uh, needing to become better and are becoming better at understanding diseases of the blood and and yet we've got a long way to go dr jonathan cohen is on the phone uh dr cohen is the medical director of infusion services at the winship cancer institute of emory university in atlanta and he treats hodgkin's and non-hodgkin's lymphoma patients he's a member of the physician staff at the bone marrow and stem cell transplant center at winship cancer institute i'm sure he has seen some amazing advances in his career. He's talking to us this morning about the most recent research on Hodgkin lymphoma uh, presented at the 58th annual meeting of the American Society of Hematology. Dr. Cohen, you've got so many credentials. I would use all your time if I read them all. Good morning, sir. Uh, Good morning. It's great to be with you. And I just want to say a quick hello to my friends and family in Central Florida that are listening in this morning as well. Oh, nice. nice. Where, Where do they live? So I have some friends in Orlando as well as in Gainesville, which is where I used to live and did my training. Right. Oh, perfect. All right. Well, I wish you were here. You could wave to them. I'll wave on your behalf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm waving on the little video camera we got. Um, yeah, we've got a, a drive this coming Saturday. I don't, there's a six-year-old boy who has bone marrow failure. I, I don't think it's connected to Hodgkin's lymphoma. He's got some other disease. I mm-hmm. can't remember what it's can't called. can't pronounce it. But, but I guess the, the layman's term is, is bone marrow mm-hmm. failure. And yeah. so they're having a bone marrow uh, drive. Robert and I uh, are whatever. We signed up for that. Years ago. Uh, yeah. Years ago, but we never actually had to, uh, We never got a call. Mm-hmm. Um but we're here if you need us. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's excellent. We appreciate uh, everyone that pr- uh, provides samples and the bone marrow drives is important. Uh, you never know when that call is going to come in, and so we appreciate all that support. Yeah, the lady. The just real quick before we get to your topic, the the mother of the boy who's the the the, the reason for the drive on fr- on Saturday mm-hmm. told us that another child she knew died because two um, people who matched decided mm-hmm. to back out they didn't want to go through with it yeah at the last minute they didn't oh my gosh and list. and you know who knows if they even know that that's what happened but she she made the point if you're gonna if you're going to volunteer to get the swab then you have to be willing to go the whole way so sure sure that's always a tough situation you know sometimes we have donors that for reasons outside of their control aren't able to donate at the time that they're yeah. called yeah. that's just all the more reason for everyone to volunteer to be a donor just so that every patient has a number of donors to to potentially choose from if they need it so let's focus on i mean you're you're you must have a, a ton of things you could talk about as an expert but with such a little time hodgkin lymphoma um the there's a meeting and was there new information that you learned about i mean even somebody at your level Right, so we actually just returned from the American Society of Hematology meeting in San Diego, uh, where a lot of really exciting information was uh, presented, uh, for, uh, especially with regards to patients with relapsed Hodgkin lymphoma. Fortunately, most patients with Hodgkin lymphoma will be cured with currently available treatments, but up to a quarter of patients will relapse, and those are the patients that, uh, for which there's a real desperate need for advances. Oh, wow. And a lot of that information was presented at the recent meeting. And, and, and lymph- Hodgkin lymphoma is a form of cancer, right? Uh, that's correct, yes. Okay. I think that's one of the, this is one of the rare times I've heard a doctor use the word cure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Y- yes, fortunately, uh, Hodgkin lymphoma is a curable malignancy, and again, the majority of patients will be cured, uh, but unfortunately, it's not everybody, and that's where we still have work to do. Uh, and particularly, uh, some of the immunotherapy advances uh, that were described at the meeting have markedly improved outcomes for patients. Your your publicist gave me enough information to make me appear smart, but I'm not. I'm, I'm reading from here. It's, it looks like it, it hits young, relatively young people. That's correct. So Hodgkin lymphoma can actually affect uh, people at any age, 
Uh, but as opposed to other types of lymphoma and other cancers that we see, uh, there's a large proportion of patients that will develop Hodgkin lymphoma at an early age, uh, meaning in, as adolescents or young adults. And that's why even though it may affect a small number of patients when compared to some of the other types of cancer that we treat. Uh, it often affects p uh, patients that are either just trying to start a family, uh, some patients can be diagnosed when they're pregnant, or others who are just starting a career. And so that's why uh, there's a significant burden for uh, patients and their caregivers when this happens. Can it be misdiagnosed in the beginning? So uh, that can sometimes be a challenge. Uh, one of the uh, areas that I think is very important uh, for anybody that has a suspected lymphoma is that they have a good uh, surgical biopsy to help make the diagnosis. Uh, sometimes patients will have a needle biopsy, and that can sometimes make the diagnosis more challenging. The uh, the child on Saturday, just used him again. Uh, Heston. The, the, yeah, the mom said that, that the, a lot of it has to do with ethnicity. He's of Native American mm -hmm. descent. Um, does is that uh, does that apply to Hodgkin's lymphoma too? Does somebody f certain backgrounds or certain ethnicities have more of a chance of getting it than others? So Hodgkin lymphoma, especially being as rare as, as uncommon as it is, we don't typically see a specific association with, ethnic with ethnicity, uh, but there are some subtypes of lymphoma that predominantly affect uh, men, whereas others predominantly affect women. And so both genders and people of all ages uh, and ethnicities can potentially be affected. And, and the only reason I think that question is an interesting question or, or an important question is because if we want to know if our children are more likely to have a disease, whether, regardless of what it is, I don't, I don't know if you agree with what I just said there, but th that, I mean, I, I hope it didn't sound like I was trying to make a racist kind of a statement. I just, I just always wonder if, if you, you know what your background is, you might know, you might be better prepared for what is lying ahead for you. Absolutely, and there are certainly some uh, cancer subtypes that very clearly uh, are of increased frequencies uh, in different communities. Uh, I think for Hodgkin lymphoma, for uh, people that are concerned, uh, the most important thing that they can do is have a regular follow-up with their primary care physician uh, who can potentially identify uh, concerning findings on physical exam. And this is particularly a challenge for young people who uh, often aren't the first to go to the doctor. And so I think um, educating younger people to make sure they have a yearly physical uh, and that they report any symptoms that they may develop to their physician is important. When you use the word cure before, is it possible for the patient to have a relapse? Uh, unfortunately, that still is the case in up to a quarter of patients. And so, again, while 75% are cured with initial therapy, a quarter of patients will relapse. Many of those patients can still be cured uh, with currently available aggressive therapy like a stem cell transplant, like we were discussing. Uh, but for others that are unable to go through a transplant or who relapse despite the transplant, that's where these new therapies, including immunotherapy, are particularly uh, important. Uh, in, in previous years, those patients had a very poor prognosis, but fortunately with some of the new agents that are being developed, uh, the prognosis is markedly improved in that setting. So uh, the science is probably way more complicated than you can explain in a tiny interview, but is bo the bone marrow transplant is what cures this, this type of patient? In a subset of patients, yes, they can be cured with uh, a bone marrow transplant. And wow. there are a number of different uh, transplant procedures that are performed, and so certainly anybody in this situation or who has a loved one in this situation should have a, a, an in-depth discussion with their treating oncologist and probably be referred to a, to a, a large referral center uh, to, have, to, to discuss this. Uh, but yes, that certainly is a consideration. If you heard this interview early on in your career, would it sound like a miracle? I have to say, it's, it's really remarkable what's happened, uh, even in the time that, uh, that I've been uh, practicing. We've seen several new drugs that have been approved for relapsed Hodgkin lymphoma, and patients that only a couple of years ago uh, would, have been, would have had very few, if any, options are now leading normal lives on treatment, uh, many of whom are working, uh, working full-time, raising their family, and doing better than we ever thought possible even a couple of years ago. It's really been a remarkable achievement over the past few years. I, I, w I want to ask you if, you, if you wouldn't mind, I, I know that we're not supposed to mention uh, brand names and stuff like that, but if this helps somebody, maybe a brand name would be important right now. Is there a product called Optivo or something, something like that? That's 
correct, yes. So Opdivo or nivolumab is one of the agents uh, that is currently FDA approved for relapsed Hodgkin lymphoma and was the subject of several clinical trials that were presented at the recent meeting. So with somebody listening who is like really keenly interested in this, and, and again, we have listeners right now and then we'll have future listeners who watch the video, um, the, 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 what do you call a podcast, it's spelled O-P-D-I-V-O. They can ask their doctor about it, right? Absolutely. I think that's the most important thing is to have an open dialogue with your physician. There may be some instances where this is not an appropriate treatment for you, uh, and only your personal physician who knows you best can answer those questions, uh, but it certainly is always worth having that discussion. All right. I know you're doing a lot of these. Uh, can you squeeze in a website real quickly? Uh, sure. So for patients that are particularly interested in immunotherapy or lymphoma in general, I typically recommend that they go to lymphoma.org. That is the website for the Lymphoma Research Foundation. Also, lls.org uh, for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society is a very valuable resource. Okay. Uh, doctor, thank you for the work that you do, and thank you for taking time to be with us on the radio. Uh, my pleasure. Have a good day. You, thank you. So we'll be right back. 69 to 73. Friday, partly sunny and even cooler, high 60 to 64. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Joe Lundberg. Hey, this is Matt Wilkerson from Verizon. You work all day, right? So why would you want to spend your night out shopping for that new phone? Well, Marion County, let me and Verizon help you out. I can deliver to your home or office, saving you precious time. Phone, tablets, internet, home phones, even accessories. Whatever you need, we will deliver free of charge. Call me at the store, 352-528-0020. That's 528-0020. Central Florida Eye Institute is the area's leader in laser vision correction. From high-definition refraction surgery and LASIK vision correction to custom cataract, glaucoma, and diabetic treatment, you can count on Dr. Crowley and his effective, friendly staff to provide you with the quality care you deserve. Call 352-237-8400 for an appointment or more information. That number again is 352-237-8400. Looking forward to service your vision needs. Hi, this is Vanessa Lane Jennings with the Jennings Law Firm, located here in beautiful Ocala. Join me every single Friday at 1030 for Legal Lane. We'll be discussing various legal topics such as family law, criminal law, contracts, and much more. So this is your chance to call in with your legal questions and have them answered. That's every Friday, 1030, right here, WOCA The Source. Veterans are the foundation upon which our freedom is built. Listen to The Source WOCA each Thursday at 9 a.m. to Veterans News with Hank Whittier from Vets Helping Vets. You'll hear tributes, information on veterans' issues, and stories that will make you laugh, cry, and feel proud. Veterans News always focuses on the military, past and present, and on our first responders. Veterans News is brought to you each week by Bob Wines Camellia Gardens and Nursery, keeping you blooming since 1952. Robert, how do you like my design? You're designing a box? That's not a box. It's a doghouse. Rough draft for your rough rough? Sounds like you need personal service. I do? Yes, to print the blueprints. See Mark at the Personal Service Center. He can print blueprints, notarize permit applications, print and mail out invoices, and even provide great-looking business cards. Personal Service Center. That's the one on the corner of Northeast 25th Avenue and 24th Street, right? Just look for the yellow signs. Your pedigree palace will be a reality in no time. Hey, Robin, did you know the Pac-Mail store has moved? After 22 years of business in Churchill Square, they moved? Yes. The new store is one mile west of their old location on 17th Street, right across from Penn Flooring. Do they still have the same smiling faces and great customer service? <laughs> they pack it, ship it, crate it, and freight it using FedEx, USPS, DHL, or UPS. You can ship all those Christmas gifts. You shop, we ship. Pac-Mail, 1202 Southwest 17th Street, Suite 201. Call 352-368-9779. This is Joe and Patsy Martone. Wishing you a Merry Christmas. And a Happy New Year. From WOCA. The Source. 
I'm Jennifer, the Executive Director of Palm Garden, and I would like to wish everyone a very Merry Christmas. I'm Mary Ann, the Director of Clinical Services, and my staff and I will ensure that the needs of all our residents are met. I'm Sue, the Director of Guest Services, and I will be fluffing pillows for our new guests staying with us over the holidays. I'm Crystal, also from Palm Garden, and I hope each of you have a blessed Christmas as we celebrate the Savior's birth. Merry, Merry Christmas from Palm Garden! This winter, LifeSouth Community Blood Centers is asking donors to give from the heart. Winter is always a challenging time to meet the needs of our local hospitals, but the need is great. One out of every seven patients entering a hospital needs blood. Keisha was one of those patients. She needed a blood transfusion immediately after giving birth. That transfusion gave her a second chance at life, allowing Keisha to hold her baby for the first time. So give from the heart this winter and donate blood with LifeSouth today. For more information, visit www.lifesouth.org. All right, 20 minutes after 9 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Not a bad-looking Wednesday, and the uh, temperatures are expected to change, I guess, sometime today. We thought it was going to happen yesterday, didn't we? Yes. Uh, we have on the phone an author. Her name is Shilpi Somaida, Somaida Gauda. Gosh, sometimes it's easier to read the name than the pronunciation guide. Um, she has written a book called The Golden Sun. It's a novel, and mm-hmm. Sun is S-O-N. Uh, she is a New York Times bestselling author, uh, a Moorhead Kane scholar, and a pottery and chess enthusiast. That's cool. <laughs> uh, she's going to talk to us about her book, of course, and also the struggles of new immigrants and the challenges that they face. Good morning, Shilpi. How are you? Good morning, Larry. Thank you for being on the air. Are you in New York right now? Where are you? No, I'm in California. Oh, in California. Well, thank you for getting up early. <laughs> My pleasure. Um, yeah, what, so did I, how did I do on your name? Shilpi Salmeida? So, so Gouda, right? That's good. Uh, Shilpi Somaya Gouda. Somaya. Okay, Somaya. See, if I look at your name, I probably would have said it right. But I got a yeah. pronunciation guard here and I, a guide, and I'm, I'm always horrible at that. So are you an immigrant, or, or is your, are you from a family of immigrants? Uh, yes, actually both. So my parents are originally from India, and they left India um, in their 20s and ended up settling down in Canada, which is where I was born. Oh, okay. I spent my um, my life up until I went to college in Toronto, Canada, and uh-huh. then came to the U.S. as a college student and have been here ever since, so about 30 years. So I am both an immigrant myself, and albeit in a less culturally shocking way, <laughs> between Canada and yeah, right, the U.S. Right, right. So the the child of immigrants. Yeah, I would I would imagine the culture shock between India and Canada is way different than Canada and the U.S. since we're kind of yes. the same. What so? Did they leave India because of financial reasons? Why why did they leave India? Um, My father was studying. He was getting his master's degree in engineering in London. And, you know, I think he was just a wide-eyed young man who wanted to see the world and Uh wanted to live all over and um, work for large companies. And so they always intended to go back, but they lived in the Middle East for a few years and Europe and then ended up in Canada. And I think by the time... They'd been gone about seven or eight years. My yeah. mother realized that they weren't going back. <laughs> I, I often wonder when, because uh, my own family has immigrant history. My uh, my grandfather and grandmother and mother, my mother was three, came over from Germany in the in the 20s, so you can tell I'm probably pretty old. But but the reason they left was because the political scene was starting to get so bad that there was no work. And I often wonder when people immigrate to a place that they think is going to be better, do they not realize that, okay, maybe it's better, but there's still a lot of struggles associated with that. Yeah, I think it's it's easy to un- underestimate what the, um, you know, what the struggles and challenges of being an immigrant are going to be, particularly, yeah. you know, back in the, you know, for my parents, it was the 60s. Uh, for your family, it was in the 20s. I mean, there was no communication. It was very difficult to even right. make a phone call across the ocean. It was almost impossible to travel except for you know, maybe every five or six years. So the ties were really cut, you know, um, largely when people left. And, and mm-hmm. we didn't have the kind of global, globally aware international world that we have now. I mean, in most right. cases, you have to, you know, learn English, um, you know, in order to survive and, and uh, you know, maybe for the first time and have to eat new food and, right. you know, learn cultural customs. And so I think mm-hmm. it's, 
you know, it's e- even if you go for um, the best of reasons, um, which you know is the is is uh, how my parents came. Uh, it's it's very challenging, and uh, that's one of the things that you bring out in your book through the different characters and the different families. You touch on tradition, but then you also bring in the free thinking aspect of it. Right. So the main character in my novel, the the titular character, the Golden Sun, is a young man who comes from you know a, a large lo- uh, land owning family in rural India, and he's sort of expected to inherit you know, the the mantle of being the head of his family and the community leader. And um, he has a different dream for himself, which, which is to become a doctor and to go to America to do that. So he leaves, um, you know, a place where he's kind of the, the big fish in the small pond and ends up being a uh, medical intern at a big urban hospital in Dallas, which, you know, he's very much at the bottom of the food chain. So, so he has several cultural adjustments mm-hmm, to make. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, you know, and he and he faces all of them at once. Just just based on what you've told us so far, that does not sound like it parallels your dad. But I'm wondering if, in writing this, were you able to, I guess, through your imagination, through you know, vicariously through words, were you able to go back as if you were part of that whole immigration scene, from especially from India? Yeah, there's there's definitely a pattern of um, of challenges that that immigrants have gone through when they've come as professionals, which I think, you know, sometimes seems like it's not going to be as difficult, but, you know, there's that feeling of being caught between two worlds, not really belonging in your old world anymore because everybody thinks that you've left and you're on to different things, but, you know, definitely not fitting in in the West yet. So I think that push and pull, which is a little bit more of a subtle challenge, um, is one that I definitely uh, drew on my own family experience, my you know my father and my parents' friends, uh, their experiences. And then you do have the character of Lena, who, uh, unlike the um, uh, uh, male character, she was pushed into an arranged marriage. Right. So th- the story really centers around these two childhood friends, Anil, uh, who we've talked about, and Lena, who's a girl who has very few options, you know, in terms of education and work. So she is, um, she moves to a- another village to have an arranged marriage. And uh, Anil and Lena, you know, sort of start off in the same place and are the closest of friends and then each go on their own journeys. Uh, and then their paths cross again later in life as adults when, of course, everything is much more complicated. Oh, my gosh. So th- this took a long time to write, or, or did it just kind of flow out of you? This sounds like a, a, um, a, a, a multifaceted story. It is. It, it took a long time to write. It took me about five years, wow. uh, which was not, not my intention because... Uh, this is my second novel, and so of course I made the mistake of thinking I knew what I was doing the second time around. But <laughs> I, think that, um, I think the story itself was just a little bit more subtle and layered um, and complicated than I, you know, than I thought it would be when I started. But you know what? A, a really well-written novel, and I'm sure that I'm not telling you anything new or, or anybody who who loves reading. It's not about getting to the end. It's the whole journey. It's everything in between that is the... I mean, that you like being in that place, you know? Uh, especially, it sounds like you've developed characters and and human interest things, uh, and that would appeal to me. Yeah, it's... Um, I, I agree with you. I think it is about the journey, uh, and I think... Um, you know, it's it's like being at a party and meeting somebody new and just enjoying the time with them, not so much knowing, you know, right. what are they going to do tomorrow, what happens at the end of the story. It's it's about getting to know them. Is your dad and mom still alive? Uh, yes, they are. Yeah. My <laughs> father, um, in fact, they just celebrated their 55th wedding anniversary yesterday. Wow, wow. And and do they see themselves in the book, or do they not? have they not read the book yet? Oh, they've read it. Um, yeah, in fact, I think also my father and my parents-in-law see themselves a little bit in the book, and um, friends of mine who've had parents uh, immigrate kind of in the same era have said that they see their parents in the book. I think there's just something very familiar about mm-hmm. the that immigrant story that even if your parents have come from, you know, Europe or Latin America or, uh, you know, somewhere else, there's there's something about that kernel of the story of people getting up, you know, leaving their homeland. Yes. In of a better life and you know trying to set themselves up in a new place that is very that echoes kind of across 
across cultures and countries. Yeah. And the uh, uh, children need to be able to spread their wings without feeling guilty that they're abandoning family tradition. Oh, gosh. Right. Right. It's very much, it's also very much a story about, you know, what is, what is your responsibility to your family and your community versus your own dreams and ambitions and how do you balance the two, which we all do, no matter where we're from. And that's what I was going to say that no matter where you're from, you're probably going to relate to the story in in some way. Uh, well, what an honor to have you on our show. Thank you for doing that. Um, is the book available wherever books are sold? Wherever books are sold, it's the Target book club, uh, book club pick of December. So it's in Target and Costco and all the regular places. And you have a website. I do. It is www.shilpigouda.com. Shilpi Gouda. Oh, I should have gone there before we got on the air. Uh, Shilpi, thank you for being on the air with us. And if you celebrate the holidays, have some good ones. And, and if you don't, find I somebody don't who does. <laughs> you as well. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> thank you. All right. We will be right back. Okay. News Radio. I'm Lillian Wu. The president-elect trumps Hillary Clinton as Time Magazine's Person of the Year, Mr. Trump telling NBC's Today Show. I've been uh, lucky enough to be undercover many times this year, so uh, and last year, but I consider this a very, very great honor. Times managing editor says that Hillary Clinton was the number two finalist. The trial starts today for the accused in the South Carolina church massacre. Dylan Roof proudly told people he entered Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston in summer of 2015 for the sole purpose of killing African Americans. He had hoped to ignite a race war. Further investigation showed Roof to have been espousing racist views online. Fox Radio's Evan Brown, Roof could be sentenced to death if convicted of hate crimes in this federal trial. And Iraqi special forces have captured a new neighborhood in eastern Mosul from ISIS, according to a senior commander. Fox News, we report, you decide. Okay, so everyone makes a holiday wish list this time of year. And usually these lists are filled with all kinds of the latest gadgets, games, and the hottest new gotta have it gifts. But is it possible to give a gift they'll love that might not be on their list? The answer is yes and I'm here to tell you what it is. I'm David McNeil, inventor of WeatherTech floor liners. You see, at WeatherTech, we start by using lasers to measure a vehicle's interior, so each floor liner is custom fit to each specific make and model. So whatever you drive, your car's floor will be fully protected up the front, in the back, and even up the sides. And the best part is they are made right here in America. WeatherTech also has a full line of premium automotive accessories that make ideal gifts for everyone this season. Ordering is easy. Shop online at WeatherTech.com or call 1-800-CARMATS. From all of us at WeatherTech, happy holidays. Experience Christmas at Gaylord Palms, presented by Fujifilm Instax, November 18th through January 1st. Enjoy spectacular holiday decor, dining, and entertainment, including ice, with an all-new theme featuring a Charlie Brown Christmas, Cirque Dreams Unwrapped Stage Show, Breakfast with Charlie Brown and Friends, Alpine Rush Snow Tubing, and much more. It's everything Christmas in one extraordinary place. Tickets and overnight packages, including priority extra cool hour admission to ice, are on sale now at Christmas at GaylordPalms.com. Christmas time is here, and this holiday season, Gaylord Palms puts a brand new twist on a Christmas classic. It's Ice, presented by Pepsi, featuring a Charlie Brown Christmas by Charles Schultz, November 18th through January 1st. See the whole Peanuts gang carved in over 2 million pounds of colorful ice, including Snoopy's decorated doghouse and dancing at the holiday play rehearsal. Your awe-inspiring experience concludes with the wonder of the nativity and ice. For tickets and packages, visit Christmas at GaylordPalms.com. Here's what you may have missed on the John Tesh Radio Show. We are more motivated to walk when we're at an interesting destination. Boy, I agree with this, whether it's a park, down Main Street, or even at the mall. The people we sit next to at work, we now know they can have a huge impact on our performance. 
our mucous membranes dry out on planes. We lose some of the food's aroma. But breathing more deeply as we eat on the plane will make a bland meal taste a whole lot better. Intelligence for your life on the John Tesh Radio Show. Don't miss this stuff. That was the sound of a tree falling. It could be your tree. You're going to have it trimmed, but never got around to calling Pride Tree Service. It could have fallen in a field, and now all you have to do is call Pride Tree Service, and they'll have it quickly out of the way for a great price. But don't wait until the tree falls. It may not fall in the field. It may hit your car, your house, or worse. So call Pride Tree Service today and avoid all those headaches before they happen. 